Hi everyone, welcome back to your free daily bread. I lowered my microphone this time, so <laughs> I watched the last recording, it was so loud, I apologize for that. So let's just start with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together and getting in your word, and I just pray this um, touches open hearts and open ears who want to hear your word and want a relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we left off at verse 20, so we're in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. So here we go. Wisdom cries without. She utters her voice in the streets. So Solomon first showed how dangerous it was to listen and join sinners. Okay, so here he declares another danger when one does not listen to the cries of wisdom. That's intense. Solomon present, presents wisdom like as a person, like a woman who offers her guidance and help to the world. <clears throat> so she cries and look, she cries and utters her voice in the streets, but sadly is often ignored. Wisdom invites sinners to repentance and to submit to Jesus, but unfortunately is rejected by most. One in Christ is the only one who is truly wise. Look at 1 Corinthians one twenty four. In the back. 124. Okay. But unto them which are called, that means chosen, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. If you don't have Jesus, then you don't have the wisdom of God. Look at verse 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Amen. Look, those who are in Christ, born again, those are the ones who have wisdom. Those are the ones living righteously, okay, um, living in repentance. Look, sanctification, that word means like a maturing process um, to, to learn holiness after you become born again. Redemption means we have been saved. That's amazing. Let him glory in the Lord. Those are the ones who glory in the Lord. Amen. I'll go back. Look at Colossians. Two, three. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's amazing. The Holy Spirit. That's, that's where the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge is in the Bible. Amen. Noticing, um, Colossians, in him, that is Jesus, is wisdom alone. All the treasure one needs. Amen. So this wisdom is, is valuable. Why? Because it's, it's, it's eternal. That's why. So look, crying in the streets means wisdom is not hidden. Also, that's what it means. It's, it's not a secret. It's available for anyone. So right now I'm thinking of people who like who street evangelize right now to to make this literal. They're literally crying in the streets, but they're it's just ignored by most. The tragedy is there's too much noise and people can't hear what really needs to be heard. God calling them. Mm -mm -mm. But instead they listen to cluttered communication foolish advice and a loud TV and rotten music, which leads them farther from the wisdom that is calling. Look at Matthew twenty-two fourteen. 14. Look, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's intense. Many are called, few are chosen. Those not listening to the shepherd's voice and those who reject his call is because they aren't his. That's devastating. Look at John 10, verse 4. Look at 
And when he puts forth his own sheep and he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Who is the great shepherd? That's Jesus. We know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Amen. True Christians, we follow the shepherd's voice. Those who follow the shepherd's voice, they hear the cry of wisdom. Verse 21. She cries in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she utters her words, saying, I'm just going to go into verse 22 since it's continuing. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. That's intense. Verse 21. Look, she is crying. Who's she? That's wisdom. Wisdom is crying loud because she cannot bear to see sinners rushing madly on their doom. Look at Philippians 3.18. Three eighteen. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That's intense. It's grieving when people refuse Christ. And look, it brings Paul to tears often. Look, wisdom cries in the chief place that's the marketplace of concourse concourse that's a a large place of gathering where there where there is like a great crowd um think of like downtown new york okay um everyone only thinking of this world as they rush on with their business and and ignore the cries of wisdom it's like they are in a trance look at second corinthians 4 4 For for in whom the God of this world, who's that? That's Satan, that's little g, has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan blinds people who ignore the cry of wisdom. The cries of wisdom. It's worse than a trance. Look, they are blinded by Satan. They are only attracted to what perishes. So even though wisdom cries at the opening of the gates, in verse 21, she's ignored. The opening of the gates, that's the place in scripture where like magistrates sit to judge. Let me take a little drink. <clears throat> so this is also a cry to world leaders. <laughs> Go to the White House. Tell me if you see any wisdom. And to clarify, I, I trust no world leader. I trust Jesus alone. Amen. Look, wisdom cries in the city. Where does it say that? Yep, in the city. World. Yep, it cries in the city. Sorry, sometimes I get a little lost on my notes, so don't mind me. Um, the most busy places have no excuse for, for rejecting wisdom. These are the most busiest places. Look at John 18, 20. What did Jesus say? I spoke openly to the world. I have taught in the synagogue and in the temple where the Jews always resort and in secret have I said nothing. Jesus is no secret. He can be known to anyone with an open heart. Amen to that. Just like wisdom cries in the street, so did Jesus. Verse 22. I already read this. Let me read it again, though. How long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? In the scorners delight in their scorning, and the fools hate knowledge. This is a rebuke by Solomon for those who reject wisdom. Look, there's three classes of people who are recognized here. 
simple ones. Those are naive scorners. Those are people who not only reject wisdom, but they actually mock it openly. Um, jump ahead. Look at uh, 14, verse 6. 14, 6. A scorner. That could also mean like a, a skeptic. Seeks wisdom and finds it not. But knowledge is easy unto him that understands. The prideful person will not seek true wisdom. Um, look at 15 verse 12. A scorner loves not one that reproves. They don't like correction. They don't like the one that corrects him. Neither will he go unto the wise. He will not go to anyone with any good advice. Look at 21, 24. Proud and haughty scorner, that's like conceited, is his name and who who dwells, who I'm sorry, who deals in proud wrath. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Proud wrath. They're proud of 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 the wrath that's coming. That's that's intense. They're conceited about wrath. Scorners are proud and arrogant, and we live in a, in a world that, that celebrates pride. And if you don't celebrate pride, then how dare you? Also, the third group is mentioned. Look, fools in verse 22. Fools, these are dull, ignorant people who, who have no truth in their, their own form of like counterfeit wisdom. So Solomon asks, how long will you simple ones love simplicity? Simplicity is for those who are just careless and easily deceived by sin and sinners. They are deluded by the world and the God of it. That's Satan. They are unwilling to depart from the comfort of their simple world views. This call of wisdom started long time ago. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walks in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. Look, wisdom, which is God, has his hands spread out all the day to rebellious people. That means every day. How ironic that scorners delight. That means enjoy rejecting and scorning wisdom because wisdom will indeed get the last laugh. That's very ironic. Um, look at 2 Corinthians 36, 16. I'm sorry. Chronicles, not Corinthians. That's back to Chronicles 36. Sixteen. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. That's intense. Like I said, how ironic that scorners delight, they enjoy rejecting and scorning wisdom because wisdom will indeed get the last laugh. Look at Galatians 6, 7. In the back. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you try to fool God, you will only fool yourself. Look at Psalms 1.1. 1, 1. The very first Psalm. Look. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Look at verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, 
but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And those bold enough to evangelize today, crying this wisdom, will also be scorned. Look at Matthew 5.11. This is, this is a little list of those who are going to be, who are blessed. Look, blessed are you when men shall revile you, persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Look, and then in verse 12, he says, if that's you, rejoice and be glad. Rejoice. Great is your reward in heaven. If you're receiving verbal, even physical threat, insulting, slander, mocking, guess what? Those are the ones that are blessed. Because they're speaking truth, they're speaking wisdom. Lost my spot. There we go. That's intense. So, um, and, and those bold enough, yeah, they will. They'll definitely be mocked. Are you scorned for standing behind God's word? Then blessed are you. Look, go back to Psalm 1 1. Notice who is also notice who is also blessed. Look, blessed is the man that what? That doesn't even hang out with the scornful. Blessed is that man. Be aware of your company. The last rebuke is look what fools hate knowledge in verse 22. How long will you fools hate knowledge? How long will this continue? Asks Solomon. These are people who wish to remain ignorant to any truth. The problem is not a low IQ. It's a heart issue because to reject truth is to reject God. These people are wise in their own eyes. Look at Matthew eleven twenty five. Jesus says, but I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Hold on. Matthew 11, 25. Sorry. Here we go. 11, 25. And at that time, Jesus answered and said, Jesus says, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hid these things from the wise and prudent. That means the educated and has revealed it unto the babes. Those are ordinary people. Why? So no man can boast in the presence of the Lord. That's why. Also, normally those who have a very high education and high IQ are very prideful. Look at 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That means to shame the wise. <clears throat> and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound, that means shame, the things which are mighty. He picks the foolish to shame those who think they're just so wise. So, when it says God picks the foolish, is referring mostly to the uneducated. Okay, the uneducated. The uneducated are picked to shame the wise in their own understanding. Normally those with extremely high IQs, like I said, will reject Christ. They are the ones who will be shamed by the foolish, the less educated. Extremely smart people normally, like I said, are prideful. And in the less educated are normally humble. So that's why God picks the foolish. 23. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Amen. This is beautiful. This is a warning call with a beautiful result. Those who turn, that means repent. At wisdom's reproof, that means rebuke, will receive the spirit. Now, when it says a spirit, I mean, it could be either like the spirit of, of wisdom or the Holy Spirit. Pretty much it's both. And that's the one who can easily understand God's word because, look, 
He makes it known to you. That's amazing. This is why the majority reject Christ, because it's a call for repentance. To embrace wisdom, one must be willing to change direction from foolishness and turn to God's wisdom. Now, the reason many reject Christ is because they must be open to reproof. That's, that's rebuke and correction. Only then will this wisdom be given and, look, pour out on you. That's beautiful. This pouring is a word of like a gush, an overflow of God's presence. Look at John 6.63. 6, Six sixty three. It is the spirit that quickens. That means makes alive. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. Amen. Jesus' words alone is spirit and life. That is the wisdom. Look at Joel 2.28. That's a minor prophet. Two twenty-eight. This is a prophecy that in the last days, um, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit. Look, pour out my spirit upon upon all flesh. That means those who believe. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old man men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Uh, many think that's some sort of like revival outpouring, a pro very uh, like prior to the rapture, but that's not true. This this outpouring started on the day of the first Pentecost. That's when it was fulfilled. So this outpouring has been happening um, since the day of Pentecost for like 2,000 years now. Look at Acts 2.17. Acts 2.17. Acts 2.17. So on um, the day of Pentecost, when they were all, um, speaking in tongues and Peter says why are you steering we're not drunk this is and then in 16 he says this is the prophecy prophecy spoken by Joel and then he repeats the same thing that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh so this is when um, that started okay so this outpouring is not some major grand finale outpouring before the rapture um, this has been going on for 2,000 years now. Unfortunately, uh, before the rapture is the great falling away. I'm not going to get into all that because it's going to take me to something totally different. But if you want to learn about the falling away um, before the rapture, you want to look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, and 2 Timothy 4, verse 3 through four but i have good news after the rapture during the tribulation during the tribulation there is going to be a great revival like never before and you can find that in revelation 7 verse 9 and 7 verse 13 and 14 of this great revival after the rapture during the tribulation all right moving on verse 24 because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. Okay, this is sad. How sad is this? Wisdom called, but is often refused. God's grace and mercy of a, look, stretched out hand. It has an expression, that has an expiration date. This is a, this is a constant invitation uh, which which needs to be accepted, but God will not, he's not going to force his love on no one. And unfortunately, not many regarded. Look at Isaiah 55, verse 6. Behold, thou shalt call a nation thou knowest not, 
and nations that knew not you shall run unto you because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. I'm sorry, that was the wrong one. Look at verse 6. 55 verse 6. Seek you the Lord. Here we go now. Seek you the Lord. Look, while he may be found, call you upon him while he is near. This is a sense of urgency. Seek him while he may be found. Look at Matthew 25 10. And while they went to buy, this is um, about the wise and foolish virgins, if you want to learn this parable, but I'm just reading verse 10. And while they went to buy, so there was five foolish virgins who um, the groom was coming, but they needed more oil for their lamps. But when they were gone is when, is when the bridegroom came. That is Jesus. This is the, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut okay that's the rapture of the church that's the rapture those whose faith are not sincere will not be raptured but sadly according to solomon Hardly any will accept wisdom. Look at Isaiah 65, verse 2. Oh, I already read this, but I'm going to read it again. I have spread out my hands all the day, and you rebellious people, which walk in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. So we must strive and accept this wisdom. Look at Luke 13, 24. Strive to enter in at the straight, that means narrow gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and they shall not be able to find that's terrifying. Look at 25. When once the master of the house is so risen up, this is like the rapture again, and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand without, standing outside the door and knocking at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. These are people who miss the rapture. And he shall answer and say, I know you not whence you are. He says, I don't know who you are. 26. Then shall you begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in your presence and you have taught in our streets. Look, they know they've heard the word of God. Oh, look and look, we have eaten and drunk in your presence. Almost well, like what they're saying prayers before they even eat, but their heart was not in it. But what will God say? I shall say to you, to them, I know you not whence you are. I don't know who you are. He says, depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. These are so-called Christians who think they can still live in habitual sin. Notice, notice where he, notice where they said, look, you taught in our streets. Look back at Proverbs 120, where we're at here. Where did wisdom cry? She uttered in the streets. Wisdom cried in the streets, just like Jesus did. Look at Matthew twenty-two fourteen. Like I said, for many are called, but few are chosen. God is wisdom. He calls many, that means invites. But only few are chosen because why? Because only few accept his invitation to have a relationship with him. Jesus does not want some of you. He wants your whole heart. Then that's when wisdom comes. But the majority, they only know of God, but they don't know him personally. He wants a relationship with you.
Amen. Verse 25. But you have set at naught all my counsels and would, and would none of my reproof. Look, but in verse 25, that word alone is terrifying because it's the beginning of what happens to the refusal of one who refuses wisdom. Look, but you set at naught. That means paid no attention to the, to the counsel. That's the teachings of God. And they also paid what? No attention to any reproof. That means they wanted no godly instruction. The most important reason in life is what it, that's what's most rejected. The most rejected in life is what's most important. Look at Psalms 118 verse 22. The stone which the builders, this is a prophecy, the stone which the builders refused is become the head stone of the corner. Jesus is the stone, the most important part of if you was to make a building, and that is what is most refused. Let me show you where this was. That this is Jesus. Look at Matthew 21 42. Twenty one forty two. This is what Jesus says. Did you never read in the scriptures? The stone, that is Jesus, which the builders, that's like the, the leaders, the um rejected. The same has become the head of the corner. That means most important. This is the Lord's doing, it is a, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Father did this. So there we go. The stone is Jesus. The one that's most rejected is the most important. Look at Acts 4.11. Four eleven. Again, Peter says, This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders. He's condemning the um the world the uh Jewish leaders like the Sanhedrin, which has become the head of the corner. The most important. Your Messiah came, but you rejected him. That's sad. This is the stone that will return. And conquer. Look at Daniel 2.44. I'm not sure if you know about the Nebuchadnezzar statue. If not, you should do um, some study about that. But I'm just going to read 2.44. Basically, this is the return of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation. And in the days of these kings... That's basically like all these Roman... All these um, empires from the Nebuchadnezzar statue... All right, so anyways, in the days of these kings shall the God, look, this is the Trinity, capital G, that's Jesus, of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, amen, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever, amen, 45. Let me see, 45, yes. For as so much as you saw that the stone, that's Jesus, was cut out of the mountain without hands. What does that mean? This is also the Trinity. It means, it means Jesus was not created. He is creation. And that it break in pieces, it broke in pieces the Nebuchadnezzar statue. These are the empires that were in power. The iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold. The, and the great God, capital G, has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the ter interpretation is true. Um, it can be trusted to be true. So this is when Daniel was telling King uh, Nebuchadnezzar what his dream meant. 
how amazing Nebuchadnezzar seeing the return, um, basically, of Jesus conquering and laying his kingdom. And Daniel told him what his dream meant. But anyways, my point, Jesus is the stone that's returning to conquer. Amen. Can't wait. So, all right, lost my spot. There we go. Um, the stone, that's wisdom. Wisdom is what's most rejected. That is the rock coming to rule and reign. His name is King of Kings. Lord of Lords, look at Revelation 19, 16. I'm all over in the Bible when I teach. When I, like, we're in Proverbs, but what I do is we're learning the whole Bible. That's just kind of my focal point is Proverbs, but we're all over the place. Look at Revelation 19, 16. This is when he returns at the second coming. This is what Jesus will have on him. He has on his vesture and on his thigh. That's kind of like a like a sash and a name written. Look, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. All right, back 26. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear comes. That's terrifying. Eventually, this call from wisdom will expire. And when it does, then wisdom will what? Laugh at their calamity. Will laugh at their disaster. This is like a measure for measure. The way they scorned and laughed at God is how God eventually will mock and laugh at them. He will have no pity, but only delight when their fear comes. That's intense. God is a God of justice. Look at Psalms 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? These are, look, and these are basically world leaders who think they can, they can conquer God. These are world leaders in verse 2. Look, in verse 3, let us break their bands. All right, and and cast away their cords for a moss. That's what the the world leaders are saying. They think they can um, conquer God. But look in verse four. He that sits in the heavens, that's Jesus, shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision, mockery. So God is sitting up there looking at these world leaders, and He's laughing at them. That's intense. The word calamity signifies like a vapor or like a cloud that's how fast they disappear when god's righteous justice comes look at isaiah 27 11. and when the bows thereof are withered these are kind of like broken branches. Um, people who are really not connected to God. They shall be broken off. The woman come and set them on fire. For it is a people of no understanding. Thereof he that made them will not have mercy on them. And he that formed, that means created them, will show them no favor. He will have no mercy. That's intense. People who keep rejecting God, they're going to, this is basically those who are going to hell for refusing understanding, refusing wisdom, and refusing God's mercy. If God had no mercy on his own people when they turned from him, how much worse on those who are not his at all? The Jews in the Old Testament, you see, are, are used as an example to display God's characteristics. The God that left only eight alive in the flood is the same God that died for us on the cross. 
Yes, God is love, but don't forget, he is also just and holy. This is not a candy-coated gospel here. There is a wrath coming from God unlike any time in human history. Look at Luke 21, 26. If anyone's trying to teach you peace and safety is coming, we just need a new world leader, um, don't be deceived. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. 21, 26. I'll look at 25, though. This is pretty much like the uh, during the tribulation, more towards the end of the second, uh, the end of the tribulation. These are signs in verse 25. Look at 26. Is it going to be so t uh, scary? Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Amen. Look. It's so severe when right before Jesus returns that even heaven shakes. <sighs> heaven shakes when Jesus descends at his second coming. That's the end of the seven year tribulation. And he is coming to end all the scorners who rejected wisdom. Um, so, again, if you're expecting some candy, cotton, you know, Candyland, Cotton Pillow Gospel. It's not going to happen here. That's probably why I'm not going to have a, a lot of views, but that's okay. I speak truth and I tickle no ears by telling people only what they want to hear. I teach the whole counsel of God. Verse 27. When your fear comes, a desolation and your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress, when distress and anguish comes upon you. Again, terrifying. 27. A fear of desolation. So that means surrounds them and their destruction. That's their calamity. Look, comes as a whirlwind. That means instantly. Instantly spreads around them with a great force. Like a tornado of wrath. There is a calamity coming that if Jesus didn't return at the end of the seven-year tribulation, then everyone on the planet would die. Look at Matthew 24, 22. And Jesus says, Except those days, what days? The seven-year tribulation should be shortened. That means if he did not return, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those are the Jews, those days shall be shortened. To keep his promise for saving the Jews is why he returns. To keep his promise. So, look at Zephaniah one fifteen, minor prophet. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is the tribulation. The great day of the Lord is near in verse 14. Even the mighty men, that means the warriors, shall cry bitterly. That's intense. But those in Christ do not fear. We only prepare by what? By staying in his word and putting him first and being in fellowship with him. You don't have to be an enemy to the cross. Look at, stay in Proverbs, look in 3 verse 25. Be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the desolation, neither of the desolation of the wicked when it comes. Look at 26. For the Lord shall be your confidence and shall keep your foot from being taken. That means you have protection. Amen. Look at 1025.
And as the whirlwind passes, so is the wicked no more. The wicked will disappear. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. Amen. That means we're kept safe. Stay in here. Look in 31, 25. Strength and honor are her clothing. Who's this? This is like a, um, a virtuous woman, a woman, a, a woman of God. Strength and honor are her clothing. She wears proudly. That's what that means. And she shall rejoice in time to come. We don't fear the future. If you're in Christ, you don't fear. We're going to be with Jesus. Also, it is our responsibility to warn people that God's wrath is coming. If you don't warn, if you don't want to warn your loved ones to, if you don't want to warn your loved ones, I, I mean, I, I don't get this. There is, look, in verse 27, the anguish and distress coming upon this world. OK, we need to let everyone know what's coming. That's love when you warn them. You want to tell them that Jesus is coming. The door to the ark is closing and we're living on borrowed time. OK, so we need to take this seriously and warn our loved ones. Verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Again, devastating. Hey, we're just reading the Bible. Just like when the ark was closed and the floods came is when they probably started calling upon God. But it was too late. And look, he will not answer. They will want him the second they are in trouble. That means seek him early, but he will be nowhere to be found. The majority still don't really want God when disaster comes or sickness comes. They only want to escape judgment or, um, or to receive healing. A lot of people don't pray unless, you know, someone is on the deathbed or something. Okay. But then they never come to him again. They only come to him when disaster comes. Okay. That's not a child of God. They only want to escape his judgment like a prisoner. That escapes his prison term. So these people are, are without excuse. Look at Jeremiah 7.25. 7.25, since the day that your fathers came forth out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have even sent unto you all my servants the prophets daily rising up early and sending them. But look, yet they hearkened, that means listened not unto me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened. That means like a stiff necked, remained stubborn. They did worse than their fathers. Worst generation. The generation just got worse. Just like God sent prophets to warn Israel, today he uses those who evangelize. And those who evangelize are just as hated as they hated the prophets. But when wisdom is rejected, she has no alternative plan for the fool. Notice. Notice that wisdom was crying in the middle of the streets in verse 20. In the middle of the streets. But now look. Now she's nowhere to be found. They got what they asked for. They didn't want wisdom. So they're not going to get it. And God handed them over. That's terrifying. 29. For they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Look, they hated knowledge. All truth of God they hated. And they chose, that means they had a free will to reject Jesus. Because why? Well, they had no fear of the Lord. Those who hate knowledge hate God. Their foolish knowledge, it chooses not to fear God. That's what their knowledge does. It chooses not. But it only chooses the foolish knowledge of this world. Verse 30. 
they would, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. That's sad. This again makes it clear why they will perish. Well, it's their own fault. The fruit of their own way is death. They refuse the counsel, that means the advice of wisdom, and despised, that means hated and, re and rejected, the reproof, that's the correction that wisdom brings. And, and what is the main counsel? Well, it's the Bible. And even so-called Christians reject to read God's counsel, the lukewarm. They don't think they need to read God's word. 31. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. 31. The consequences of rejecting wisdom cannot be avoided. The end result is judged on their fruit. Their life actions is what they will eat and be filled with. They literally consumed themselves. Look, their own devices. That means schemes and their own evil plots will self-destruct inside of them like a grenade. They will be punished according to their deserts and receive their just reward of their sins. They will then internally, like an internally, feel their own wicked life that they chose. They reap what they sowed. They refused the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. So they instead will become their own sacrifice, which is imperfect. So they must repeatedly be sacrificed in hell for eternity. That's terrifying. Hey, I'm just preaching the word of God. Look, by their fruit, we will know them. Look at Matthew 7, 17. Oh, 7, hold that. Seven seventeen. This is about the how to how to judge righteously. Righteously, he says, beware of false prophets. And fifteen, all right, they look like a Christian, but they're not. They're a wolf. Seventeen. Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. Good tree, good fruit. Bad fruit, bad tree. Bad fruit. This isn't rocket science here. Uh, and look, but a good tree cannot bring forth any bad fruit. Look at that. You'll know them by their fruit. Look at 19. Any tree that brings forth not good fruit, any tree that, that bears any bad fruit is cut down and cast it into fire that is hell. Look, wherefore by their fruits, that's like their actions, their teachings, and their lifestyle, you will know them. How do you know people's fruit? Well, you judge righteously. When people say, don't judge, well, if not, how do you know a false prophet? How do you know a false teacher? How do you know a, a counterfeit Christian, one who's not sincere? You judge them by their lifestyle. Like you will know them. Look at Isaiah 3.10. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him. This is a good thing for, for one who is born again. Look, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. That's the good fruit from the good tree. Now we are not saved by any works for salvation, but we are definitely saved for good works. 32. I'm trying to get to 33. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Notice these people turned away from God. A born-again Christian will never choose to turn away, backslide, or 
fall when born again. You are now a new creation and the old is completely gone, which means the old you can never be brought back. You are now living holy. Those who backslide back into habitual sin only prove they were never saved. Again, you will know them by their fruit. Look at Jeremiah 2.19. That word backslide is mentioned only one time in scripture. I believe this is the spot. 219. Thine own wickedness shall correct you. And your backslidings shall reprove you. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter. Look, what's evil and bitter? Well, when you backslide and you turn away from God. A Christian does not backslide. That you has forsaken the Lord your God, and that my fear is not in you, says the Lord God of hosts. That's intense. Those who backslide only prove they have no fear of God. They're not born again. They're not born again. So, it is a bitter thing to backslide into old wickedness indeed you will know them by their fruit again a good tree cannot bear any bad fruit at all it's impossible many outwardly may appear christian but their lifestyle will prove it so those who turn from wisdom are the simple Okay, those the simple who will be the cause of their own slay, death. In verse 32, they would be the cause of their own death. These people turn from God's word and give him a deaf ear. They are the simple and foolish. Oh, also pay attention, the prosperity. The word prosperity in 32. The prosperity, that's the self-satisfaction of sin, is what will destroy them. Um, give this to one who follows the prosperity gospel. These are people who only wanted to prosper in the world, ignore and act like they're following God. But really, they only set themselves on the throne of their own heart. They think it's all well with them. And the return of Christ, they think, will never come. Look at Revelation 3.15. The Laodicean church. Lukewarm. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. But then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Look, what's the main reason? Well, because you said I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And no, not that, but he, but he says, you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked spiritually. Okay. So, so worldly, they have everything spiritually. They don't have nothing. That's intense. Who's the hot? Those are on, who, the, he wants you to be hot. Those are on fire for the Lord. What's cold? Those are atheists, people who claim they don't even believe in God. So basically, he he wishes you were an atheist instead of lukewarm, because apparently those who are lukewarm receive a harsher punishment than an, even an atheist. That's intense. How do you know a lukewarm? And don't use the word Christian after the word lukewarm because they're not Christian. They're just simply lukewarm. They feel they don't need to repent. Okay? But Jesus says, repent. Look in 20 and look in 19. Therefore, repent. A lukewarm does not feel they need to repent of habitual sin. They even think they can go back to it whenever they want. 33 last one, but here's good news. Okay, we can end this on somewhat of a good note here. That was rough. But whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely. 
and shall be quiet from fear of evil. 33. But here is a light at the end of the tunnel for, for the one who hears and attaches to the wisdom in verse 21 that was crying in the streets. He is the one who hearkens, that means listens to God and will dwell, that means live safe. Now, this doesn't mean the Christian will be safe of all physical harm. It means they can rest with a clear conscience of his own integrity and upon the promises of God. They are safe in the hands of the Father. Even if they die, they will be dwelling safely with Jesus forever. <laughs> Amen. And look, and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That's amazing. The one in Christ is not tormented from sin because they are what? Living holy. A wicked man has no peace. All right, so even people who seem to have it all and they're smiling in your face, if they don't have Christ, then they have no real peace. Only those cleansed by the blood of Christ have the Prince of Peace. So we have no reason to be in fear of the of the evil one because he is a defeated foe. Amen. So Satan has no authority over the child of God. And we have victory through Christ to say no to sin. Those are the ones who shall be quiet from fear of evil. Amen. That was another rough teaching. <laughs> I didn't realize how Proverbs starts off pretty uh, intense. But hey, we're just reading the word of God. So here's our prayer. This is a prayer for those to answer to wisdom. Heavenly Father, your hand is out with grace and mercy. And we are not worthy, but because of your kindness alone, we can have salvation. Only when one has your righteousness are we worthy to be in the presence of the Father. I pray more people grab the offered hand of your wisdom. Your wisdom alone is truth. Help people who are not on your path accept correction and instruction with an open heart. You can save anyone and you are the great redeemer. We pray more grasp to truth in these last days because time is short. You are coming for your bride and we pray more get extra oil while there is still time. In Jesus name, amen.